I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher at Grace and Truth Ministries. I always read to you some of our emails before I get started teaching. Uh, we are on the internet, needless to say, throughout the world. Because of what I teach, I teach definition of Greek words in the New Testament. I don't teach one or two a month like most preachers will do if they do it. I teach, I may have 50 Greek words on the board in one lesson. I break the syllables down, tell you if it's an adjective in the Greek and what adjectives do. They modify nouns and pronouns and they... And uh, adjectives tell which, what kind of, how many. Now, that's not advanced Greek. That's English. That's 8th and ninth grade English out of 1951 and 52. And that's when I was in junior high school. They don't have that anymore. They have middle school. But, uh, and we're on TV all over America, and people are always calling me and asking me things. And uh, so uh, I'm going to read to you some of these things. That we're on TV all up and down the East Coast, the West Coast, New York, all the way down to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, we've been on in Boston and, and uh, in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. And we're on down in Charlotte, North Carolina and in Charleston, South Carolina, and up and down the, the western seaboard, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Jose, San, uh, San Francisco, and, and all over the Midwest, uh, Kansas, and all over Texas, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, San Antonio, Austin. And I get these emails. People want me to answer these questions. Some of them are very interesting. Uh, the first question on the email has been one of my favorite things to teach on. Uh, I got an email from Shola from Nigeria in Africa. Good day, Jim and family. Please, sir, read Second Kings eight twenty-five and 26 and Second Chronicles 22, 1 and 2. I've taught on that extensively a dozens of times years ago. Sir, I am particular about Ahaziah's age when he became king in Judah. And everybody would, atheists would use this to say, say this is all wrong. The two accounts do not agree. It sounds like they don't agree. It's because you don't understand something. Please shed more light on this supposed contradiction. Thanks. Agape and Phileo, Shola in Nigeria. I have really gone through this. Uh, you have to understand, before I read this, what a regent... And the co-region is, a co-region is the son of a king. A regent was a king, and the son of the king was called a co-regent. Seen, we've seen that in other places in the Bible. When a king, when uh, Belshazzar's father, Nabonidus. It, his father was not Nebuchadnezzar. His father was Nabonidus. He fled uh, Babylon because he was having a fight with, having a difference with the sun and tree worshipers. So he left town and left his son Belshazzar in charge, and Belshazzar destroyed everything. But the same goes for these verses here. Let me read them to you. These are the ones that's posing to you. In the twelfth year of, jo of Joram, or it can be also pronounced Jehoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, did Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, begin to reign. Two and twenty years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. He had to have been his father's co-regent, taking the place of his father. 
but his father was still king. And he reigned one year in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Athaliah, or Athaliah, however you want to pronounce it, the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. And then when you go over here, it sounds like it's contradicting. It says he's 22 years old there. Then it says in the 22nd chapter of Second Chronicles, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem made, this is verse 1, Ahaziah, his youngest son, king in his stead, for the band of men that came with the Arabians to the camp had slain all the eldest. So Ahaziah, the son of, of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. Forty and two years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. This is talking about when he was full king. He was just the region over here in the 20s, in the second Kings, the eighth chapter. He had to have been just the regent. You're going to find that you don't, you have to understand. I have people write to me and say, well, the Bible says they had the, they had the, uh, Passover in the month Abib. And then later on it will say it's in the month of Nisan. Well, Abib, what it was what it was called in Israel, but when they were carried into captivity, Abib was March, April, and Nisan was March, April. But that was a Babylonian name, Nisan. You gotta understand the way they thought of things. Now, if you're talking about a date like Kislu, C-H-I-S-L-E-U or L-E-V, however you want to pronounce it or spell it, Kislu was the was December, the month of December in Israel. But they started counting their year from Nisan, March, April before all the way to the next Nisan, March, April. If you're in Babylon, they started counting after, not ab, not before. This would be another illustration of a part being a whole. They started counting in Babylon the following year after Kislu. And it's going to look like it's contradicting, but it's not. It just depends on whether they're in Israel or whether they're in Babylon. I hope that'll help you, Shola. And then Ken writes to me. I don't know which Ken this is. Is this Ken up in Iowa or what? Uh, Hi, Pastor Brown. I enjoy your video on Bichud. I don't even know what that is. Are you sure you're spelling it right? I agree with most of what you have to say. But I don't, I don't understand why you believe Apostle Paul but not Oral Roberts. Well, Apostle Paul was a truth teller. Oral Roberts was an out-and-out -out liar. Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith was said to be 14 years old when he found those gold plates that he copied and, and began the uh, Mormon church. Do I believe Joseph Smith talked to God at 14? No. Does this not, uh, Baptist, etc. Why do you not believe Oral Roberts, Joseph Smith, and a Baptist? I'm referring to Matthew 24. Well, he's saying, Woe unto the Pharisees and hypocrites all through that chapter. Jesus has clearly said, Matthew 24, 26, This is not sound. And awful. What? Your, your words are twisted. This, this, this does not sound an awful like Apostle Paul. What do you mean by an awful? Ken, Ken, you're going to write me back and make this statement clear. I don't know what you're saying. When people have something in their head and they think I'm going to understand what's in their head and I don't. Write me back, tell me what you mean. Stephen Cook in Louisiana, he came up here for a couple of the picnics uh, that we had years ago. Hello, hey Stephen. 
Hope all is well with Grace and Truth family. I have a question that's been bothering me for some time, and I'm wondering if anyone can help me with it or point me in the right direction. Here's my question. Is it wrong to be cremated? No. <laughs> I mean, what about someone that burns up in a fire? Does that mean, and they're in a building, does that mean they have to go to hell? No. What about somebody that is uh, eaten by a shark and they end up as shark poop? Does that mean they have to go to hell? No. Or do a cremation on a loved one that wants it? That has been bothering me for a while. It shouldn't. We're all going to go back to dust and all the fire does is take it back to it quicker. Because that's, my, that's what my dad wanted. And I wanted when my time comes. And my dad and I questioned it just before he passed. I asked some people. And the only thing they found was maybe it is pagan. It's not pagan. When they burned their children in the fire, they weren't dead. They were alive. Or something. There's nothing wrong with cremation. Besides that, why saddle your family with fifteen thousand dollar funeral bill when you can get it for twelve or fourteen hundred being cremated? Why put them under that kind of burden? Because that my dad has changed his mind and so we buried him. But I would really like to know. Thanks in advance, Steve Cook in Louisiana. I, I, once I'm gone, you can take my body and put it in the local garbage can. I'm not there. And may I add, funerals are for the living, not for the dead. Don't do the dead any good. And that's what the flowers are for. They used to bury the people before the body began to decay. But when they started stinking, they sent flowers to the funeral. That's what they were for, to kill some of the stink. Then Rick in Ohio, Brother Jim, I want to say I enjoyed yesterday's sermons, teachings. God gives us answers to what we struggle with understanding. The message seems to be shouted from the rooftops. God's will be done. It's so much better when one knows that. Knows that. Thank you for all being the vehicle that brings these truths. God has shown you to us. Praise the Lord for truth. Amen. Rick in Ohio. I talked to him yesterday. He's a truck driver out of Chesapeake, Ohio. We love you, Rick. Keep on writing. Sharon Ledger from North Carolina, she's been with us a long time. She writes, Brother Jim, can you expound on... Boy, I love this verse. <laughs> Proverbs 22, 6. I could talk about this all day long, but I won't. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. The word train up doesn't mean take him to some Baptist Sunday school. It doesn't mean take him to some Pentecostal church so he can learn to speak in tongues, which there's no such thing. Train up is the word kanak, C-H-A-N-A-K. It means to narrow them, put them in the narrow way, the tribulation way. Teach your kids they have to go through tribulation. Narrow thalibo means to crowd through a narrow opening. And it comes from the word thalipsis, L-I-P-T-H-L-I-P-S-I-S, which is the common word tribulation teach your children they have to go through tribulation that's what you should need to teach them that's what it means we know that being the elect of God is all in his sovereign will before he laid the foundations of the world and we cannot manipulate that truth in any way on our own that's why I define it all if you define that in your 
Strong's Exhaust Concordance. It'll tell you to narrow them. So when we train our children and grandchildren in his ways, in his hodos, in the ways that the narrow, where's the narrow hodos? In his truths, as they are children in adulthood, their conscience at least has his way etched into it. That's right. Whether they manifest as his elect or they aren't, is this correct interpretation exactly without even defining the word? Is this the interpretation of Scripture? Once again, thank you to all for all your hard work and obedience to serve us sheep. Sharon Ledger, North Carolina. We love you, Sharon. You've been writing to us for years, and we appreciate it. Gibby Reno in Tyler, Texas. I sang at Tyler Junior College one time in a big concert. Uh, Gibby Reno in Tyler, Texas. Thank you, Pastor Jim, for updating the online videos for me. I have been listening to these videos with my Bible, and I can't get enough. I so appreciate you that you teach with the truth. I've been sharing today of what I have been learning and see. I plan on watching these a few times so I can absorb the Word. I was converted in the Boston Church of Christ in 89, and it was taking me years to overcome the doctrine that they teach. Baptism has been a struggle that I have wrestled with, but the more I listen to you, and read the word, the more I see the truth. Communion was another one I struggled with. They weren't eating crackers and grape juice. They were eating the Passover. The Bible says so. That's what gets me. Preachers can't see they were eating the Passover. And now it's spiritual Passover. I have been listening to your videos and I'm seeing what you're teaching. Thank you. I can't begin to tell you how grateful I am that you're teaching what other churches do not teach. Thank you. That is a great statement. Much love. Gibby Reno in Tyler, Texas. All right. Now, then I've got some emails I'm going to read. These are people. No, wait a minute. I already read them. I thought I had some uh, YouTube comments. No YouTube comments. I got a letter from... John in Belfast, United Kingdom, and that's over in England. And it's a long email, but I'll read some of it. All right. Hi to everyone at my spiritual family across the pond. They call the Atlantic Ocean the pond. Here in the UK, plus, as this has possibility of being read out, I talk to those of you watching, Jim, teach true Christianity. And I can only live in hope that you have been blessed with the hearing ear and the seeing eyes, that the message from our ministry makes sense, or at least a little sense to you. I appreciate that. A fellow told me the other day, he said, I love what you teach, it makes sense. I hope that you new viewers will listen and learn while the pastor teaches, talks to teach. I hope you will understand that you may have the ear to hear and the eye to see, but under no circumstances do you have a tongue to speak gibberish. That's right. With, with from the Lord. If you come from the background of Pentecostalism, I, as a complete stranger to you, live in hope that the seed we as ministry place will one day take root. Those like myself who are keen gardeners know that the seeds essentially die as they fall and dry out. Perhaps the seed placed in your hearts are yet to receive a thunderstorm to come to your lives and cause disruption. But that seed will germinate and you will break down on your knees and cry out for help from Christ. 
Well, I like this guy. I like John. Sounds good. He cuts your hearts and will make you a new being. For those of you who think you have it together, we think God will pour money or great health your way just like as you seem to think. He poured some special ability to speak in tongues, and may I add, that's glossal and dialects. So as I love languages and have many phrase books covering most of the globe, as I'm from a travel background, can you please each write me a Pentecostal phrase book for the essential traveler, and I can add it to my extensive collection. You have come to some, you have come for some reason to watch this video. Do what you did in the classroom and actually listen. That is what wise people do. They listen to the first entire speech, make notes, do your own fact checks in scripture, then you'll begin the art of effective communication. If you are the type to shout at the screen, shake your head and be quick to jump to a response before Jim finishes, that means you are prejudging. Another point I will add is that this notion of interpretation or in your opinion, uh, or your interpretation, response before Jim finishes, or your opinion. News for you, God is not interested in your opinion or your interpretation. May I add over in Second Peter, the first chapter, the Bible says, there's no prophecy of Scripture of any private interpretation. The word private is the word idios, I-D-I-O-S, and we get the word idiot from that. And it means self or one's own. Idios. Whenever I call a man an idiot, that's because he has a self-interpretation. We get the word idiotes, I-D-I-O-T-E-S, or idiot. And it means completely unlearned. That's what Kenneth Copeland is. He's an idiot. Another point I will add is this notion of interpretation or your opinion. Then he goes on to say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are going to sit in a tribunal one day and your opinions won't matter one bit. That's right. Baptist, Pentecostals, Church of Christ, Episcopalians, Roman Catholics. We have been given the Textus Receptus and those with an ability to explain things correctly. No error involved. Now, new listener, I don't mean to rub you the wrong way, but I speak with true compassion for your souls. Are you willing to step out of the broad way of the world which leads to destruction after you are pulled into that tribunal and judged for eternity? Or are you willing to do as instructed and follow Christ's likeness on the narrow path which gives you a godly pardon for the sin in your life or not? If you think a hot summer with no air conditioning is bad, no water to drink, food to eat, seeing, seeing the the worst havoc and chaos around you, you can't escape is bad. Think of how it was for a short while. Now imagine a week of it, five years, a hundred, eventually until you realize it's never ending. When you die on earth, you'll get an eternal life. Well, it won't be life. It'll be an eternal death in hell. It will be an eternal existence in hell. You will feel every bit of pain magnified. I don't want that on any human, but I'm not sitting on that godly tribunal. You will, with absolute certainty, attend. No tears or pleas from loved ones can help. No candles, kind words, 
or those you leave behind will matter. Many of you think one day you will see your departed family. News is, sadly, many won't be there. You can be, well, only if you're elect. You have had this video interject your life for a reason. Over 10 years ago, I had one too. However, I'm a learner. I listen. I thought and searched and understood. I had to undo the lies I was told as a kid. I did too. I stood on the side of Christ over my flesh family, but they are listening. They know I had extreme trauma in my life. But how many of you would be at a point to give thanks for such things? How disappointed were you when you found out Santa was a lie? I was. Disappointed me that my mom and dad would lie to me. I remember at six or seven thinking, how could they do this? Most I figure how many are willing to listen now to find out the warped form of Christianity you're involved in is a much serious lie and your so-called sky pilot local Belfast language for idiot like a priest attempting to get you to heaven. They call them sky pilots over there, I guess. In front of the church, as your soul in mortal danger, is your life in danger, someone or yourself would call for an ambulance. Yet who is calling for emergency to help your soul? Grace and truth, spiritual family, I love you each dearly. You are, you are global. So the gospel of truth has been fulfilled that it will reach every nation. I, with God's help, when I move properly, send a letter to you more regarding the geopolitics and gospel prophecy. It's getting close. Not an opinion, but reality. I understand many don't follow global events. With much attention to observe, our God has truly blessed us with certain abilities or skills. Personally, I take it. He felt it better. I quit traveling and selling the world and giving me the mind to see it. But through a different prism, may each conform to the likeness of Christ at the speed God intends. I try to show patience to understanding. To, and to, it took the cross beside Christ's cross for one to truly profess his belief whilst the other slipped into eternal nightmare. Thank you, Lord, for this ministry. Few find the way, but I'm eternally grateful you said to follow you on the narrow path. Listen to learn. Let Jim talk to teach. Agape John Belfast in the United Kingdom. John, we love you, brother. I know you're on the line, and y'all have got a group of people that are on live stream, and y'all just keep on doing that. That's all the letters I got. What I want to do is... Uh, give you a few announcements. We're on TV all over the country. Uh, we're on the internet around the world. A lot of times I get letters, get emails from Australia, Japan, even got one from China, and um, get them from all over Europe. We get them. From, I don't read all the emails I get. Tom said you can't read all of them. There's hundreds of them. So he picks out some for me to read. And uh, we give away the DVDs free, and we never, ever call you back and ask you for money, ever. And that's If you want to support this ministry, that's between you and God. We've got an overhead. We've got about forty-five to $47,000 a month that it takes to, to break even in this ministry, to get ahead, we got to bring in more than that. So uh, we're trying to put together enough to buy a small building. You will never have 
a mega church teaching what I teach. Christmas is pagan. Easter is pagan. Easter and Christmas are the same thing in the ancient world in different cultures as Mardi Gras and Halloween. Same thing. They did it different. It was just the renewal of the birth of their son God in the ancient world. It had nothing to do with Jesus. Nothing. They have just tried to Christianize all that paganism. And uh, we give away our DVDs free. All you have to do is look at our website, graceandtruth.net. Or you can call me at 1-800-625-5409. Locally, our phone number is 615 Eight two four, eight five zero two, and uh, we try to help some of the needy people. We've got several needy people that are really in a struggle. I don't just give money to anybody. You have to be a believer. You have to be listening to this ministry. You have to be commenting by email or by letter, and you got to be saying some things along the way that you love predestination or you love this teaching that Christmas is pagan. (coughs) But if you say that, I'll call you and talk to you about it. I'll ask you some questions you won't... If you're trying to con me, I'll ask you some questions that you won't be able to answer. So we give to the poor and the needy believers in this message. A lady called the other day and said, I need help. I said, we only help people that believe the truth. I said, what do you think about Christmas? She said, oh, I love Christmas. I said, we hate it. <laughs> it's Christ Mass. It's Roman Catholicism. Oh, I only, I don't only like it. So I used to like it sometime. I don't like it now. She was trying to put the con on me. I'm sorry, but you, I, you gave me your answer up front. You haven't been listening. Just to call me and say, I'm listening, and you take some notes out of one of my messages and say, oh, I believe this word and this word and this word. Well, explain it to me. What do you believe about it? Anyway, we're on TV in Nashville Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night. I'm teaching, right? Well, I'll be teaching about an hour or so in Nashville. And we're on... Uh, channel 49, Comcast TV. And uh, we're on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night at 8.30. And then we're on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. And uh, we're on radio in Nashville. Saturday morning at 9, we're on WNQM. That's 1300 on the AM dial. Then if you move the dial over to 1360 every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in the morning, we're on in the morning at uh, around 6 o'clock and then 7.30, then 8.30, and then 9.30, and then we're on the afternoon at 1.30 and at 4 o'clock. And then we're on Saturday in the morning, 8, 9, and 10. And we're on Sunday in the afternoon at 1 o'clock. So just be watching us. And uh, if you want a free DVD, they're free. We never charge for Paul said, I give the gospel without charge. I will not make you feel obligated to give one penny to this ministry. Not at all. That's between you and God. I believe when we give these DVDs away, some people, it takes them a year or two before they start supporting us, and I never ask them for it. One fellow called me after he'd been getting the DVDs for nine months. He said, you've been giving me DVDs for nine months, and you told me when I called you that you were never going to ask me for money. And he said, you never have. So I'm going to start supporting you. I said, that's between you and God, not between me and you. So they're free. Now, I think that's, if you want to 
give to the needy. I've got a lady that's a paraplegic down in Prairieville, in Louisiana. I send her money each month. I send her $200 a month. Not me, but you as this ministry. And then we've got a lady with uh, leukemia in Amarillo, Texas. We send her $300 a month because her leukemia, her, her cancer bill is 15000 a month, but her insurance pays that, but she's got nearly $500 rent plus uh, utilities, and that's 165 or 70 And then time she pays, she only makes $1,000 a month. Time she pays these bills and buys a few groceries, she's out of money. So we send her money each month. We send Amanda Meadows out here in Murfreesboro. She's a little black lady about that tall. And she's just a dear sweet lady. And she's she's trying to raise her kids and uh, her grandkids. Her daughter's on, daughter was on drugs and she had to take her daughter to court and get custody of her children. And she did. And we're trying to help her. And she just scoots along the best she can. And then we got a little black lady up in Dayton, Ohio. Her name is Elizabeth Taylor, believe it or not. And uh, we send her some money every month. I've got, and then I got a lady out in Arizona. She's got severe rheumatoid arthritis. It's just made her, nearly made her a cripple. And I got a lady out here in Lebanon, Tennessee. And she's got a, a taxia. Taxia, or taxis is a Greek word. It means an orderly arrangement. Ataxia means there's no arrangement to her muscles in her body, and she's just losing control. She said her mother died with this, and it strangled her. And she said you lose the ability to swallow. These and others we given, we send money to because they need our help. That's our obligation as believers. If you want to send gift cards, we'll welcome them too. And we've got people we give those to that need some help. Well, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this truth and for this ministry. Thank you for the words of people like John over there in, in England. And Lord, thank you for people that really care. Lord, we pray that you'll open up doors for this ministry that we can reach out and reach people that are elect and they can get behind the ministry and support us and help us to go forward. Lord, all I want is to get this message to the world. That's my main goal in life. Thank you for everything. Fight our battles in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I hope that answered some of your questions. I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I'm teaching to you about some things that it's, it's a, a myriad of directions it goes. Everything in the Bible is related to everything else in the Bible. We've been talking to you about the kingdom of God. Let me erase this while I was teaching a while ago. We've been talking about the kingdom of God and how it is not the thousand-year reign. There's no such thing as a thousand-year reign. 
The word millennium is not a biblical word. It's not Bible. Millennium, I-L-L-E-N-I-U-M. Millennium comes from mill and anum. Mill means thousand. Anum means years. Now, I'm not going to go through this again. There's not a 2,000-year period. There's not a 1,000-year period. There's a 2,000-year period. I've explained that. There's a 2,000-year period. I believe that will show us we're close to the end of time. That would, If the day is the Lord was as 1,000 years and 1,000 years is one day, this would be the 2,000-year period where the Gentiles or the nations could not be deceived. It says nation in Revelation 20. But nation is the word ethnos. And the word Gentile is ethnos. There's one place. All through the Old Testament, the Gentiles were blinded. They were not extended the truth except for a certain special few people. Like Ruth. And like Rahab the harlot. Possibly Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar made one of the most fantastic statements in the Bible. He was the king of Babylon when Israel was attacked and carried away into captivity because that's what God wanted him to do. And he, after he got struck down on his all fours for seven times. Now it has to be seven months because it couldn't be seven weeks because his 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 nails that had to go out by like bird claws, and the hairs like uh, eagles' feathers. That would be seven months, and it wouldn't be seven years. He couldn't eat grass for seven years with the cattle and still be alive. When he stood up on his feet, he made one of the greatest statements that ever been made in the Bible. This was from a pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar. He said, "All the inhabitants of the earth." are reputed as nothing. He doeth according to his will. Speaking of God, this is a pagan king talking about Jehovah God. He doeth according to his will in the inhabitants of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, I mean the armies of heaven, among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, What doest thou? He does everything. And that's what we're talking about. All of this... When we're talking about the kingdom of God, we're talking about the kingdom of God, and we have to talk about baptism. <laughs> Not water. We don't believe in water baptism. We're baptized into the kingdom. That's where people get this, get this idea you're baptized into the church. The church is... The kingdom of God. The Bible says so. It says that we are heavenly Jerusalem, the church. Does Jerusalem have to do with Israel? Yeah, I guess so. So we're heavenly Jerusalem, the church of the firstborn, heavenly Jerusalem. And that's the church. And then the Bible says again, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything there in Galatians, the sixth chapter. He said, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Let me just say this about creature. The word creation is the word katesis, K-T-S-I-S. You don't become... You don't become a new creature until he births you into the kingdom of God. And kingdom of God was a title for Israel. And he said right after he said, as many as walk according to this rule, the rule of a new creature, peace be on them and upon the Israel of God. The new creation is God's Israel. That's what the Bible says. I don't know why preachers want to fight this. 
It's insane. And then Jesus turned around and told the Pharisees comes to Jesus and they say, are you going to restore the kingdom at this time? That's because the only people back from the captivity was southern Judah. Northern Israel was the ten northern tribes, the ten lost tribes. And they weren't back in the days of Jesus. Only southern Judah was back from the captivity. Israel was the northern kingdom led by Ephraim. The second born son of Joseph. And Ephraim had the inheritance. If the one who had the inheritance is not home, they said the thing was un unoccupied. Mm -hmm. Southern Judah was comprised of the tribe of Judah. They named the southern kingdom after one of the most important tribes. Judah was the fourth son of Jacob. And since the king had to come out of Judah, they just called southern Israel, Judah. Jerusalem was right here in the tribe of Benjamin. So the temple was in Benjamin. Therefore, Benjamin had to be, had to be classified with Judah. So Benjamin and Judah was the southern kingdom. And they were not back during the first, during Jesus' day. Now, so we're talking about heavenly Jerusalem the church. Israel is the church. <laughs> what gets me, the Bible says, he said there in Genesis, the sixth chapter, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision doesn't even matter. But to be in Israel, you had to be circumcised. Well, then what do you say? Then you're saying, well, what about What about if we're spiritual Israel, what is our circumcision? You could not partake in the Passover, Pentecost, Feast of Ingathering, any of that. If you were a Gentile, you'd come to Israel. You couldn't partake in any of those rituals unless, unless you were circumcised. This is before Jesus was nailed to the cross. You had to be circumcised, washed in water, and offer two turtle doves. And all that was in the law. Except it was literal over here. It was a shadow. And it was the very image over here. The very image. Over in the New Testament. New Testament. Old Testament was a shadow of skia. That's the word shadow. It means a shade. The shade doesn't have all the parts to the body. You go outside and you cast a shadow. You can't see your circulatory system. You can't see your pulmonary system and your lungs. But you can see it over here. So you have to go to the New Testament. So we are spiritual Israel. You had to be circumcised. We are circumcised. This is a, something I've been looking forward to talking about. I want you to understand that you had to be circumcised and that equates with baptism. Because circumcision is cutting off the filth of the Flesh. Or how, what if I put it this way? Circumcision is cutting off the outer man by the inner man, which is Christ in you. And you got, this is something that preachers don't even preach about. They don't tell the Christians. You got two men in you. One of them is hard to get rid of. And that's the flesh. That's self. That's self. I can't teach all of this in one lesson. You say, Jim, you keep on repeating this stuff. <laughs> this thing goes, it is unbelievable how deep it goes. Baptism is death 
to self. Or death to the flesh. And the Bible says in Romans 7, 7, 30, oh, not 30, 25, in 7, 25, that you have two men in you. Paul said, I got two men. I've got the outer man that serves the law, so law of the flesh or self. And then I've got an inner man that serves the law of God. These match up with, most people don't even know what these word, these verses mean. 1 John 1 and 8. If we say we have no sin, if this man says he has no sin as a believer, we lie and do not the truth. Every man wrestles with this flesh and every woman wrestles with this flesh. The only way you can get over it, you can't. God has to circumcise your heart. We are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, the Bible says in Ephesians the second chapter and Colossians the second chapter. We're circumcised with a spiritual circumcision. So God has to cut off this outer man and we're going to see what this is about. He's going to, and that has to do with baptism. Baptize. Circumcision and spiritual baptism are one and the same. Baptize comes from two words. Boy, but you're going to miss this if you believe in dipping people in water. You're not even going to deal with that outer man that won't behave himself that God has to take years to get rid of that man. If you to ask somebody, have you had a hard time being a Christian? Only somebody that's fake and funny will say, Oh no, brother, brother, hallelujah, praise God. I've been a Christian for 40 years and, and I've never had a hard time. Well, then you are a liar. Because the Bible says you're going to have a hard time. So, 1 John 1 and 8 says, If we say have, we have no sins, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And, but the same book, 1 John 3 and 9 says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. That's the inner man that's born of God. This outer man is flesh. It's not born of God. God is going to get rid of that through years of circumcision. Years of fire. The fire and the trials and the persecution and all of these things, tribulation, tribulation. Over the years, you'll go through so much of that, one day you'll wake up and say, what am I doing? I did that. I, I, I was a believer when I was a little kid down in Fort Worth, Texas. But I could see myself, what I did for years. I sought this outer man. I wanted to be a famous singer. I had a great tenor voice. Even a lot of the old gospel singers will tell you that. One of the Oak Ridge boys was sitting in the bank one day about 18 years ago. And he was sitting there. He's been with them. 40 years, I guess. He was sitting there as I walked into the bank. And he looked at the bank and turned and looked at me and said, there's the singer. I had this super voice. God had to take it away from me to get my attention. And he got it. I have never been this contented in my life. I'm content now because I'm trying to say the truth all the time. And you get this outer man is self. And baptism is spiritual circumcision. Because baptized comes from baptizo. Baptizo and bapto. Baptizo means to 
whelm. It does not mean to immerse. Now, if you have a later model, Strong's Concordance, they may put immerse in there, but it doesn't mean that. To whelm means to overwhelm or to cover with something. If It's like if I'm laying in bed and I tell Mary, I'm, I'm real cold. Have you got a blanket? And I say, would you cover me with that? I don't say, would you dip me into the blanket? <laughs> you can't dip somebody into a blanket. She has to cover me with it. And bapto, it'll say, see, bapto. Bapto means to stain. How many times have I put that on the board? Stain or to dye. To dye. Bapto was a term used by women to stain and dye clothes along with the word baptizo. It's like Mr. Girdlestone said, one of the great scholars of the last several hundred years. He says, the word baptize had a dual meaning. He said it meant to cover and at the same point to stain with a dye. Well, a blood baptism, you can get this out of dozens of my books in my library. A blood baptism they style that or call that a martyrdom. You become a martyr. What's amazing, the way you become a martyr is by another morpheme of that word, martus. Martus, M-A-R-T-U-S, is the word witness. That's the way you become... <laughs> And over the years, as you witness, that produces tribulation, persecution. But you won't do that yourself. You can't do that. Because there's none righteous. There's none that seeketh after God. Nobody seeks God. Therefore... All of this spiritual circumcision, spiritual baptism, or spiritual witness, all of that is connected to, directly, predestination. Predestination is the word pro horizo. Now, here's the thing. Let me show you how it connects to all this. For whom he did foreknow, whom? All of the whoms that God foreknew, none of them seek God. You did not merit your salvation by anything you did. If you belong to God, he will arrange your life. The Bible says we've obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. So all things would include everything that's going on in this outer man's life. The tribulation, the persecution, the trials to cause him to conform to Christ's image. To be a martyr and a blood baptism. Blood baptism is the death. Cutting off the filth of the flesh is the death to self. There's a verse that I don't think hardly anybody has ever explained properly. We go over to First Peter. First Peter. I've never heard a preacher explain this. If you believe that baptism is water, you will never explain this verse. I've said this so many times, I can't even count. Let me get my other Bible. That's one that's new, and I can't turn the pages as well. All right, go over to First Peter. And you. this all goes together. God has to preordain us he has predestined us 
to be conformed. To the image of his son, Jesus. His son is alive in us. That's what we've got to conform to, what he says and what he does. We have to obey him. So, when you're talking about to be conformed, sumorphos, S-U-M, M-O-R-P-H-O-S, Sumorphos means to be shaped, morphe. And sum means in fellowship or blended together with other believers. That's the way you're shaped. We are shaped in the fellowship. This inner man is going to be shaped by causing this outer man to die. And we know that it takes two witnesses Two morphe, or, or two martyrs. It takes two witnesses to put a man to death in Israel. The same is applied to that outer man. It takes two witnesses to put that outer man to death. It takes the inner man causing the outer man to vote with him that self must die. But that's a hard thing to get a hold of. Self has to die. It's easy for me to get a hold of because I'm 83. <laughs> it's not hard for me to understand that now. God has nearly beat the tar out of me for a lot of years with tribulation and trials and persecution. So, baptize is a death. True death. Let me read this verse to you. This is a verse that I've heard preachers talk around it. They have no idea what it's talking about. All right. First Peter. If you want to turn over there with me. If you get off base on predestination, the rest of your understanding of the Bible is askew. It's twisted. You have to know predestination and believe it for things to come together. You can't have baptism without it. And he says here in 1 Peter 1, or excuse me, 3 and 20. Speaking of God's preaching to the spirits in prison, I'm not going to go into that. Prison, the spirits in prison were the Gentiles Prison Fulake, P H U L A K E, is the word prison. It will go with this because it's the division of day and night, or light and dark. Well, that's what we're predestined to the light. The light is the same thing as the horizon. And predestinates the word prohorizo. There's an eight sound with that diacritical mark there. It means to predetermine for the horizon. The Latin's put an end on later. So it means to predetermine that a man will come out of darkness, this outer man, to light, to the inner man. He'll come out into the light. And we are predestined to be conformed to the image, icon, likeness of Jesus. Predestination has to do with everything we're talking about. It has to do with self-will. If God doesn't foreknow somebody, nobody's coming and nobody's going to heaven. It's absolutely necessary for God to have predestination. It is an imperative that he had predestination because nobody gets to go. If you think you're good, are you really good? Have you ever lied? Huh? Have you ever cheated? Uh, have you ever sinned? Ever looked on a woman to lust after her and she's not belonging to you? You ever lusted after a man? 
How many sins can we talk about? Have you ever stolen something from somebody? How about just a little thing, a fountain pen? I have. Have you? People used to get in my car when I sell real estate, and if they accidentally dropped a cross pen, I'd drive on down the road and say, well, I came out like a rose on that one. And I didn't. I had to learn. I had to learn to stop that. That's the outer man that wants to have his way. It's no different stealing a pen and chasing and going after a woman that you're not supposed to be going after. So predestination, let me put it this way. This light equates with the inner man and this darkness. This is the horizon here. And this darkness equates with the outer man. It's that simple. And it takes God preordaining it for you to come out of it. Because you can't. It takes those beatings. It takes the straight and the narrow way. Straight and narrow. Straight is the word stenos. Narrow is that word thalibo, T-H-L-I-B-O. It means to crowd through a narrow opening, be pressured on all sides. Being a believer, taking a stand for the truth, it's like we're being pressured by the world, doesn't it? Once you start witnessing, once you become a witness, and you're provoking people to put you in the fire and the trial and the persecution and the tribulation, once you go, once you become a witness, they start putting you to death. You become a martyr and your blood baptized. Look at this right here. He says here in First Peter 2 and 20, when sometime you were disobedient, where once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, 120 years God waited. Noah went out in his backyard and built a boat. That was probably one of the main reasons they were laughing at him and taunting him. Because he didn't go down by the river and build a boat. The river was going to be in his backyard. So when he's building this ark, he doesn't go near any water. What's the use of having water? It's all going to be water when God gets through with it. That was probably one of the big reasons they were laughing at him. He's building it in the land. While the ark was a preparing wherein few that his eight souls were saved by water, except it's not the word by in the, in the original text. It's the word dia. Through. They were saved through the water. The water was not the baptism. The pitch of the ark was. Pitch. I've said this at least 200 times in the last six months. Pitch has the exact same meaning as baptism. Same. Gosh, I'm going to have to erase some of this. I'll just go down here. Pitch. Here's the word pitch. Pitch is the word kafar. K-A-P-H-A-R. The Lord said, Noah, pitch it with pitch. The second word pitch, this is a verb. The second word is a noun. Pitch with pitch. The first word pitch, kafar, means it's the same exact word as atonement. God did not have the high priest go into the, into the temple, go, into the, go through the veil on the day of atonement. He didn't have them go through there for the Moabites or the Egyptians or the Syrians or any of those. He only did that for Israel. 
and he sprinkled the ark, and that was the true baptism. First word pitch means, kafar means to cover. Same word, same exact meaning as baptizo. Or bab, baptizo. And then he says, pitch with pitch. Second word pitch, kafar. K A P H A R. Oh, no, excuse me, not kafar. Kofar. K O P H E R. This is kafar. This is kofar. Kofar means to stain and to die. Exact same meaning as babto. Now, let's get back to reading this verse here. As eight souls were saved through water by the pitch. The water was the judgment of God. That wasn't what was saving them. It was destroying the enemies of God. The like figure. Figure is the word added to pawn. means the corresponding figure. One that corresponds. Wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. The same way they were saved in the ark by the pitch. We're saved by the blood of Christ and he's washed us from our sins in his own blood. Not the putting of the way of the filth of the flesh. Not by literal circumcision. God's got to cut off self. That is our biggest problem. Me. Jim Brown has been the biggest problem I have had. Because when I was out there in the world with this great voice wanting to be somebody famous, have you noticed all famous people die? I mean, they die and they're dead. Elvis is dead. The most famous rock and roll singer in history. Michael Jackson's dead. One of the biggest singers ever. They all die. Glenn Campbell is dead. And most people don't even... You ask an 18-year-old, you ever heard of Glenn Campbell? No, I don't know nothing about him. In 1970, he was one of the most famous men in America. Had his TV show and had all these hit records, one right after the other. Most people don't even know who he was. He died just a couple, three years ago. What? I can't hear you. You got to say something louder than that. But let me get back to this. So he said, baptism, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. He's telling you, if this is talking about literal baptism, it doesn't make any sense. If it's talking about blood baptism, that's the same way we're saved, the same way that we're saved in the ark, by a pitch, except it's Christ's blood. When you look at look at Revelation, the first chapter, a blood baptism was a death. You can get that. I've got that statement in dozens of my books in my library. If you read something besides playing games on the internet you can find out some things here in Revelation the first chapter last phrase of verse 5 unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood that is baptism the Bible says as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ Put on is the word in duo, E-N-D-U-O. It means to sink into clothing. Our clothing is not something. Our clothing is righteousness. It's, a, it's righteousness. That's our clothing. The Bible says so. Look at Revelation 7. Revelation 7. John was viewing, he was having a vision. 
the angel took him and showed him that before the throne in verse 9, before the Lamb, there were clothed in white robes, men from every nation under heaven, clothed in white robes and palms in their hands. They were shouting, crying salvation to our God. And then he came, this angel comes to John and said, do you know who these are in these white robes? White is always a picture of righteousness all through the Bible. And John says, I don't know, sir, in verse 14. Thou knowest, I don't know who they are. And he said unto me, these are they that came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. People say, how do you know you're a believer? Well, you have to be going through all of these things to get rid of self. You cannot go to heaven just by going to church and singing hymns in some church where the preacher doesn't tell any truth. He's a free will preacher. He has to be telling truth. And you have to be hearing truth. And you have to be repenting of your sin. When you repent, that's not something easily done. That's not something you do. That's something God does in every one of His elect family. I guess my very favorite verses on repentance is over in Jeremiah. If you go over to Jeremiah in the 31st chapter, Jeremiah 31. In verse 18, And Jeremiah, northern Israel, which was the land of Ephraim, had already been carried into captivity in 722 B.C. So when he's referring to Ephraim, he's talking about northern Israel that's already been carried away captive because this is sometime in the neighborhood of 580, some 580, 89 to 80, 80, 87, somewhere in that neighborhood. And this is right before Israel was carried away. And then he says in verse 18, I have surely heard Ephraim, northern Israel, bemoaning himself thus. Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised when you beat me with these Assyrian armies. And I was carried into Assyrian captivity. And as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke, the yoke of a kingdom was the laws of a kingdom. I was not accustomed to these Assyrian butchers. That's what he's saying. Because that's who carried Israel away, northern Israel. Turn thou me. This is Ephraim crying out, Lord, turn me. Repent is the, in the Greek is the word metanoia, M-E-T-A-N-O-I-A. It metanoia means to be turned and then see. You can't turn yourself. You can't repent unless God deals with you. The Bible said it is the goodness of God. In Romans, the second chapter, goodness, Christatos, C-H-R-E-S-T-A-T-O-S. Christatos means to meet a need. It is actually related in structure and sentence structure and word structure to the word kriya, which is the word anoint. You can anoint yourself, and anointing is the same thing as baptism. He's anointed us all over. Then he says, Surely after that I was turned, after I was shavah, crying in tears, Shava, S-H-A-V-A-H. Let me erase some of this. Predestination is directly related to all of this inner and outer man because God's got to turn us. We cannot turn ourselves. He says, here, turn thou me, and I shall be turned. 
I can't turn myself. I don't want God in the flesh. This flesh of man wants nothing to do with him. How does he get that inner man? He had nothing to do with it. God picked him out before the foundation of the world and said, this one is mine and I will arrange his life where I will heal. I'll cause him to hear the gospel, either going down the road in the car and he'll hear some preacher. He may even hear a false teacher and the false teacher has a little short area there where he reads from the Bible. And the guy says, oh, this is, sounds like truth. I've had people come here and say, I was led to truth by a false teacher because they read the Bible. And, and he'll, he'll start believing. So as he starts believing, it's because God comes into his heart plants truth in his heart that's the seed the word of God that cannot sin it's born of God then let's finish reading this surely after that I was turned I repented the word repented no psalm the word turned is the word shavah s-h-a-v-a-h That's the word turned. And turn means to cry with tears. Means to feel bad about what you've done. And after I was turned, I repented. No calm. N a c h a m. N a c h a m. This is going to tell you what true repentance is about. I repented. I was sorry. I sighed, said, I haven't been so wrong. And then he says, and after that, I was instructed. I was willing to listen to the word of God and to be instructed, yada. That way I could know what the truth was. You, you cannot go to school and take a course in college and be instructed unless you crucify self. You cannot go into a, a calculus class and say, well, I don't think that means that. And the professor is going to say, look, you, you have to keep quiet. You're going to have to leave the class. I'm the teacher. You're not. You've got to listen to Christ's instructions. I smote my thigh. That's very interesting. When Abraham called Eliezer to him in the 22nd chapter of Genesis, he said, place your hand upon my thigh. What they meant, place it on my testicles. We'll get the word testify from this. And swear by my seed that you will not take a wife of these pagans for my son. You go to the land of you go to the land of my fathers over there to Babylon and get my son Isaac a believing wife. Swear to it. So what he's saying, you'll swear to God, but you won't take that oath. Remember oath? Shabua. B-U-A-H. Comes from the word Shabbat, which is the word seven. Seven. Shabuah means to take an oath or to seven oneself. And we have to add seven things to our faith. So our faith will increase or that inner man will increase and begin to take over the outer man. I always put concentric circles. That's one circle inside of another. Because that inner man, as he works upon our lives, he's going to cause us to be willing to take the blame. That's what the rest of this verse says. He's going to, he says, I smote my thigh and I was ashamed. Bush, B-U-W-S-H. B-U-W-S-H. That's the word shame. It's not talking about one of the presidents. Somebody said, I found the word bush in the Old Testament. Well, I'm sorry. It means to be ashamed. And I guess they ought to be ashamed. <laughs> because I did bear 
the reproach of my youth. That word bear, no saw, means to yield. I took the blame. Kerpa is the word reproach. C H E R P A H. It means to be blamed, and I took the blame. So that's what repent is. That all has to do with this. This outer man has to repent, and he's got to die. But that none of that will happen without God picking his people, coming into their lives and their hearts, crushing them with all of these tribulation and trial, and causing you to give up. You may not be giving up today, but you will give up if you belong to God. And you may die before you completely give up, but he'll get you to give up as much as he wants you to because he's in charge of every action of everything that's happening. Started a quote to you a while ago, we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will, everything. There's no need to get angry Anytime, at anyone, when you're a believer. But you will. <laughs> Until you learn not to. All getting angry does, it lets it turns loose certain juices in your body that gives you ulcers or gives you headaches or gives you uh, blood problems or gives you, it gives you all kinds of diseases. High blood pressure. There's no need to get upset over anything because God has already planned it all. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. And what is his works? Everything. You mean people doing me wrong? Yes. He's doing that for your welfare if you're a believer, for your good so you can learn not to get angry. Do you know that people that do you wrong, the only reason they do it is because they believe they know they can get by with it. But if you won't respond, they don't know what to do with that. If you just say, oh, well, I guess I'll have to stay away from you, you from now on. So we have to become ashamed. We have to bear our reproach and take the blame. Taking the blame is hard when you think you're right. Isn't it? Well, I'm a pro at that when I was young. I never wanted to take the blame. But even if you're right, take the blame anyway. Well, that boggles people's minds. Now, all this has to do, I said that baptism has to do with circumcision. It's God getting rid of all this outer man. By the inner man, when he brings about trials and persecution and fire in our lives, and you witness, and that's what you go out and tell people predestination is true, your very witness will make them put you through tribulation and fire and persecution. You tell them Christmas is pagan and God does not love everybody, and a sinner's prayer is not true for, sal for salvation. It's not true. The Bible says... We know that God heareth not sinners. Any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. The Bible also says, How shall they call on God in whom they've not believed in Romans 10, 14? Right after he said in verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you call upon God, you're going to already be a believer. You can't call on a God you don't believe in. That's what he's saying. Belief is the method of salvation. Tell a bunch of Baptists that. I said the other day that the Southern Baptist Convention had a quorum or whatever you want to call it. And they got together and they had a vote as to whether the sinner's prayer was true or not for salvation. Boys, it's not true. The Bible says, yes, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But you won't call until you believe. Don't you understand that? Well, then what do you do about believe? You study it and find out what it means. Believe and faith are the basic same word. Faith is the noun. Believe is the verb. A noun is a person, place, or thing. Faith is a thing. Faith. 
P-I-S-T-I-S. Believe. That's the verb form. This is the verb. This is the noun. Believe is P-I-S-T-E-U-O. See the P-I-S-T? That's the stem of the verb, of, of the word. That's what the word is built upon. The end of the word depends on, it'll give you the tense, the voice, or the mood, or it'll give you some character of the word. If it's what tense it is, past tense, future tense, whether it's masculine, feminine, neuter, gender. These are basically the same word. So if believe is a verb, that's what you do. He that doeth truth come to the light. You don't do truth, you hadn't come to, oh, to what? To the horizon? Prohorizo, before determined for the light or the horizon. I hope you can get a hold of these things. I have got all these places in the Bible. I've got them marked where the Bible's talking about putting on. Remember, he that Galatians 3.27 He that is baptized into Christ has put on Christ. You're going to tell me that you baptized in water and you put on Christ that way? Or you've put on the blood and you put on righteousness? Those white robes were considered robes of righteousness. And they were made white in the blood of Christ. I, I don't understand... Every bit of these things that I'm saying go with one another. Now, let me do this. Let me begin to show you some of these words about put on. And every one of these that I'm going to give to you is the word in duo. Galatians 3.27 would be more or less a theme verse for this. Galatians 3.27 As many of you who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Put on in duo means to sink into clothing. Into clothing. Now the clothing we sink into is the blood of Christ but we don't sink ourselves into it. He comes and wraps it around us. He wraps the clothing around us. That's what, when he wraps it around us, you say, Jim, I love my outer man. I like to defend myself. Your life will be miserable as long as you defend yourself. If you quit defending yourself, life becomes tolerable and easier. In fact, gosh, I, I all of a sudden want to go off to something else. That outer man is equivalent to demons. Demon means to distribute fortunes. It's the fleshly man, the outer man, that wants the fortunes of the world. D-A-I-M-O-N-I-O-N. Damonion comes from the root D-A-I-O, meaning to distribute fortunes. In the first century, so the outer man that we're trying to get rid of is the demon of self. Self is the demon. There's no such thing as demons. It's Jesus said, this goes along with the inner and the outer man. Jesus said, if I with the finger of God cast out devils, and the word is daemonion or demon in our language, if I with the finger of God cast out devils, then the kingdom of God is coming to you. You don't become a member of the kingdom of God until he casts out self with a blood baptism, with a spiritual circumcision. That's what all this is about. We're, this outer man is circumcised, but that doesn't happen one day. He has sin in him. If he says he has no sin and he's been made perfect by the new birth, that is the arrogance of a lot of these Baptists. They need to tell people, you've got an evil in you you've got to wrestle with. I've got a 
book at home. It's called Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible. And he talks about, this is by Vonder Torn, Bob Becking, and Peter Vanderhorst. One of the most in-depth teaching on demons. Let me read some of it. The term demon is the rendering of the cognate Greek words daemon and its substantive neuter adjective daemonion. Post-classical Latin borrowed the words in the forms d-a-e-m-o-n and d-a-e-m-o-n-i-u-m. The term daemon, d-a-i-m-o-n, from the time of Homer onward, was divinity. It just meant a God. A divinity is a God. In fact, when Paul was at, uh, was at, uh, he was in Greece at Athens, he runs into two pagan guys. One's a Stoic, one's an Epicurean. Paul tells them about Jesus, and they said to, of Paul, they looked at each other and said, this man is speaking to us about strange gods. The word they used, gods, was daemonion. What they were saying, we've got some gods, but they're not kazenos, X-E-N-O-S. They're not strangers to us. Hercules and Venus and these gods are not strange. They called their gods in the first century by the title of demon or daemonion. All of them called it. And demons were not evil at first. They were all good. It was later on that the connotation of demon or devil being evil. And then he goes on to say, from the time of Homer onward was divinity denoting either an individual god or goddess. That's what the pagans called Hercules or Jupiter or whatever, or any of them. Or the deity, a deity was a god. To deify something means to make it to a god. Unspecified unity, the deity will put it in mind. Decidamonia, means reverence for the divinity. That's the word that Paul, that the Bible uses in Acts, the 17th chapter, when Paul said, he looked out at Mars Hill, and he said to these pagans, I believe that in all things you're too superstitious. The word superstitious, D-E-I-S-E-D-A-I-M-O-N. E-S-T-E-R-O-S. You can see the word daemon in the middle of that. It means a D, D-E-L-I-A. It means a fear of the strange, a fear of the gods. That's what it means. It means what they did. They said, we're afraid... Paul was telling them, you're afraid that if you believe in one of these, the other may be right. So you have a fear of all the gods, so you're going to say, I'm going to accept all of them. That's kind of what people do with me. They'll say, Jim, I like your teaching, but I like Charles Stanley too. Well, he and I are at opposite ends of the universe. Well, I want to believe in both of you, and I want to believe in Billy Graham too, just in case one of you is right. That's what they're saying. You can't have many gods. That's pagan. The word pagan means many gods or many preachers. That's what it means. Then, let me finish reading this. Nisodamonia means reverence for the divinity. Plato derived the word from the near homonym, daemon, meaning knowing. From the root deo, meaning to know, Eusebius rejected this conjecture and instead derived the term from daemonion to fear. The entomology more likely stems from the root dio, to divide destinies. 
when they were having a hard time, they would pray to their God. He would come down like Perseus off that big parapet and come down and distribute fortunes to them. That's what it went back to. Thus, the word could designate one's fate or destiny or the spirit controlling one's fate or one's genius. What the Jews call demons, the the uh, Greeks call genius, or the Romans call genius. The Greeks call these guardian angels, and that, that was the same thing that the Arabs called genies. Comes from the word gene, which means ancestry. They call their ancestors their gods, and they deified them as gods. They did that with Nimrod when they deified him as all these gods in the ancient world. Commonly, the word designated the class of lesser divinities arranged below the Olympian gods, the demones. I've got this out of Harvest of Hellenism also. Demones, D-A-I-M-O-N-E-S, D-A-I-M-O-N-E-S. Those were the lesser gods. That was a, in a title of a movie, Children of the Lesser Gods. That was the lesser gods. That's what we would call demons. The ones that could inhabit somebody's body and get them doing bad things. Hesiod describes them as the souls of those who lived in the golden age. What it was, they took... Noah and deified him as the fish god because it came out of the water. And they did that as an evil god, Tammuz. They made Noah into Tammuz, made him into Dagon. Dog is the word fish in, in Hebrew. Dog. Dagon was the fish god of the Philistines. And then he goes on to say, not until post-exilic times in the intertestinal literature, with the rise of dualism, dualism means good and evil. That's a dual, constant dual. And the concept of the devil, did the word begin to display the meaning evil demon in league with the devil? They weren't even called evil demons. They were just saying, we get our substance from our gods, and they come down. We pray to... Hercules, and we play to Jupiter, and he comes and gives us the things that we want. It took an entire negative connotation that's at this post exilic period. Christian writers use it almost exclusively in this later sense. The Ammonion in the classical period meant similarly the divine power of a divinity. How many gods are there? One. I believe if there is one God, thou doest well. It could also mean the class of lower beings, lower divine beings, between gods and mortals, between gods and mortals, half man, half God. When you watch a Saturday afternoon movie about some old Steve Reeves out of the 1950s, and he's talking in English, and they're dubbing in English two of these Italian words, because everybody else is talking Italian. He's going, yes, I am Hercules from the gods in heaven. They called him a demon. They met it, let me see here. It was during the rise of dualism, it came to be used for satanic demons. And the word concept, demon, underwent Fundamental change in antiquity caused by the rise of dualism. The universe in which each member, divine and human, had its proper domain. There was as yet no arch enemy devil nor rival camp of satanic demons. And it tells you, these writers will tell you, that demon was what they called their gods in the ancient world. That's what they call Hercules. If you lived in the first century, you'd say, Hercules, they'd say, oh, that's one of our gods. That's one of our demons. All right, now, I just wanted to read some of that to you. That's very interesting. I want to show you more 
on being baptized into Christ, put on Christ. When you put on, you sink into clothing. The clothing, every time you find put on, it's going to be another picture of that clothing. Look here in in uh, Matthew 12 and 18. 12 and 18. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Behold my servant, verse 18. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, and whom my soul is well pleased, talking about Christ, and will put my spirit upon him. Put upon is the word in duo. So the spirit is what we're baptized with. Spirit is what we put on in duo. Well, that's the same thing as a blood baptism because the Holy Spirit is the truth. The Bible says so. John 14, 15, 16. John 14, 15, and 16. Sometimes I just give you the verse to start reading on. And I don't give you all of it, the exact verses. Start reading there. John 15, 26. John sixteen thirteen. First John five and six. First John five and six says the Spirit. And everywhere you find Spirit, if we're baptized with the Spirit, here's what we're baptized with: the Spirit equals, or the Spirit is truth. Here's what you're baptized with. And this is what causes people to want to kill you, put you through tribulation. Truth is the word A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A. And that is a construction of lanthano, which means to hide or to conceal, to lie hid. And the alpha in front of a word negating the word gives an opposite meaning. It means not to hide anything. So the Holy Spirit is when you don't hide anything and that is when you define all these words and then you end up with a blood baptism and you end up cutting off self. You are part of that. God has to cause you to be willing to witness for Him, to witness for Him, martyrs, that's a blood baptism. That's also the circumcision. The Bible says in Deuteronomy the tenth chapter, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Then in the thirtieth chapter of Deuteronomy, the Bible says, God will circumcise your hearts. How does he circumcise your heart? Your heart is like this inner man. And then the outer man has to be cut off through years of tribulation, fire, trials. All these concentric circles represent every hard thing you've ever gone through. What God is doing is getting you down to a very thin veneer of self where you don't get offended like you used to. I'm nearly impossible to offend. I just can't hardly offend me. People ask me, are you mad at me? I say, for what? <laughs> I don't believe in getting mad anymore. Don't believe in getting angry. All you're doing is cooperating with that outer man, trying to drive away the inner man, which is a righteous man in you. It's Christ in you. Now, let me, so he put upon him the Spirit. Now look over here in in Romans 13 and 12. 13 and 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Only God can do that. He's predestined us to be conformed to His image, His likeness. And that's the inner man. And let us put on, put on, in duo, be clothed with 
what? The armor of light. What protects us is the light. When we have got this, we've been predestined to conform to his image, predestination to predetermine for the light, to come out of prison. By the way, the word prison is the word aphesis. Excuse me. Is the word phulake. P-H-U-L-A-K-E. Phulake means the division of day and night or light and dark. And forgiveness, forgiveness is the word. Uh, what? Ephesus. Ephesus, <laughs> thank you. A P H E S I S. It means to pardon and release from darkness or from prison. So we're taken from the darkness to the light or to the horizon. That's what predestination is about. It's about making our whole life full of light and it doesn't go away one day. That's what all the tribulation, the trial and the fire and the persecution, when the Bible says we must do much tribulation. We must. That's an imperative. If you're going to heaven, you've got to go through tribulation. Has anybody had any of that? If you're over 50 and you say you hadn't had any, if you're over 40 and you say you hadn't had any, you're lying. Every one of us that are believers have gone through a tremendous amount of tribulation. I've got right at death's door several times. And boy, that'll wake you up, won't it? Yes. So he says, 13 and 12, Cast off the works of darkness, let us put on, let us be clothed with the armor of light. So the armor of light, armor is for protection. That's what faith is. It's a shield of faith. The shield of faith that we may move to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Armor and shield are the same thing. We put on the shield of faith, so faith protects us. How does it protect us from the world? I've said this a thousand times. It protects you from the world because faith dies to this outer man. It dies. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Substance. Hypostasis. Hupostasis, H-U-P-O-S-T-A-S-I-S. This is what faith, that is our armor. This protects us from the world. It doesn't protect you from getting killed or robbed. It protects you from that outer man. I've said this, and I don't even know if anybody's even gotten it. Hypostasis, substance. Substance is hypostasis. Hupo means under. Stasis means to stand. Faith is the understanding. That's what protects us because when you understand, you learn. Learner. It's the word disciple. It's the word mathetes. We get the word mathematics from that. Mathetes. It means a learner. If you're a learner, the Bible says, He that beareth not his cross and followeth after me cannot be my learner. A cross is for dying. That's for killing off the outer man. It's for dying. So faith is the inner man. And that increases. And the outer man dies and dies. But the more we add to our faith in Second Peter 1 and 5. We add to our faith. We add to our daily cross. And the world hates the daily cross because their God is their belly. 
Boy, that is an epic. That's a flesh term. Belly was a term. They said, the this, this Epicurean said, all sensual desires came from the belly, but it didn't mean the stomach. I mean, everywhere you enjoy anything come from the belly. A new car, a new girlfriend, uh, lots of money, whatever it is, that was the belly. And they hate the cross of Christ because they like to fulfill this outer man, the flesh, which is the belly. They like that. I'm sorry, but that's what we all liked when we started, wasn't it? That's what we all liked. Now let me give you some more of these. Put on. So we put on light. And that's our armor. All right. Let me give you a couple more of these. In 1 Corinthians 15, 54, I've quoted this over and over. But I didn't go as far as I'm going today. Verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We as believers will not all, all be dead asleep in the flesh. We shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkle of an eye at the last trump. We're going to be changed at the last trump. There's seven trumpets sound in Revelation 8. 9 and 10, the seventh one or the last one sounds. Revelation 10 and 7, when the last one sounds, Christ has got one foot on the land, the other one on the sea, and says, time is no more. There is no seven-year tribulation after the last trump. It's at the end. There's no millennium after that. It's over. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Alasso. A L L A S O. We'll be changed into something different. We'll have a new body. For this corruptible, Aphathartos. Aphathartos. A P H. T-H-A-R-T-O-S. Remember the word phthero? P-H-T-H-E-I-R-O, huh? Corrupt. Corrupt. This, and it says, for this corruptible, phthiros is the word corruptible, aphthiros, Means incorruptible. The alpha in front of it. This corruptible must put on incorruption, aphatharos. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible had put on, see these words put on? Sink into clothing, sink into, in duo. When this corruptible hath put on, put on, put on, put on, in duo, in corruption, this mortal shall have put on, put on immortality. When we put on immortality, that's the inner man that's putting it on. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And what is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith? How does faith overcome the world? The longer you live, the less things you want as a believer. I've seen that with old guys here with Milton. He didn't want anything. He was 94 years old when he died. Uh, Betty, uh, Judy's mother, she didn't want anything. She had a real good car, real. She had had the oil changed regular, and she bought it new, 2003, something like that. It was like a new car. She didn't want it. She gave it away. She didn't want nothing anymore. She died at 94, 95. Milton died at 94, something like that. They didn't want anything anymore. I don't want the things I wanted at 50 years old. I just don't want them. 
and somebody gave me a new Jaguar. I couldn't drive that and sit up here and preach death to self daily across and wave a diamond ring in your face. I couldn't do that. I, I'll tell you what, I'll take the Jaguar. I'll sell it and put it in the building fund. Is that okay? I don't care. I used to care about having sports cars when I was young. I don't want one at all. Just don't want one. All I want is to serve God and teach truth. The more truth you learn, the yet, that's the faith that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Overcome Nikao every time you find it in the New Testament. Overcome is a, it's a verb form of victory. N-I-K-E. We probably get the word Nike from that. If you wear Nike tennis shoes, you'll be able to outrun everybody, right? Sure you will. So, death will be swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? For the sting of death is sin. The word sting is the word kentron, K-E-N-T-R-O-N. Well, it's only a sting to somebody who's wanting to hold on to all of their outer man and their stuff. The man that doesn't have Christ in him, all he's got is an outer man. All he tries to do is fulfill the flesh. That's it. No matter what you accomplish, it seems so minor after it's all over with in the flesh. Who know? Who was the richest man in America in nineteen or in eighteen ninety six? Who cares? <laughs> it doesn't even matter, does it? Now, let me go to another couple of these. Put on. And let's go over here to Galatians 3.27. That's the verse I've been quoting to you. Let's back up in this. He says in verse 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. A schoolmaster is not a school teacher. A schoolmaster was not the guy that stood in front of the class. The schoolmaster was the one that took the child by the hand and led him down the road to the teacher. And Christ is the teacher. And the law was nothing but a schoolmaster to teach us Christ. That we might be justified by... I'm always saying faith is death to self. That's the best definition for it I know of. It's death to the outer man. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all children of God by faith, by death to self in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, that's not possible for that to mean water. And preachers will read that and say, that means being dipped in water so you can become a member of the church. That's the idiocy. Now, in fact, it reminds me of back here in Mark. I've, I've read this, but I never really finished it. How much time do I have, Mike? Nine. Nine minutes. In Mark, I started to comment on the other day and I waited till the end of the message to comment on. And it looked like I'm doing that today. And Jesus, in Mark 16, he is risen from the dead. He comes to talk to the men and to the apostles in Galilee. And he says, he says, he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's verse 15. The gospel is more than just Jesus coming out of the tomb. The beginning of the gospel, as it was written in the prophets, according to Mark 1 and 1 and 2 and 3, is prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The beginning of the gospel is to prepare the narrow way. There's only two ways, a narrow and a broad way. And the beginning of the gospel is preparing the narrow way. 
And the Bible says in Luke 3, Luke 3 and 3 that John came preaching the baptism of repentance, which was prepare ye the way. Prepare way. So that cannot be water. It's a narrow way. That's what baptism is. So when you're preaching the gospel, you're preaching the narrow way as opposed to the broad way. Many are going into the broad way. Few oligos are going into the narrow way. And you will not enter the narrow way on your own. You have to be predestined to it. Because you don't seek God. Nobody seeks Him. You don't even seek God after you're a believer. Paul said, how to perform that which is good I don't find. It's God that works in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. That's predestination. Predestination belongs into all of this. Now, let's go back over here and look at a couple more of these. Here in Ephesians 4, 22. He's talking about men teaching false doctrine that makes the church apathetic. If you quit, if you get to a place you're just, God hardens your heart. Harden means to make you stubborn. And you are stubborn and you don't want to cooperate in this, in this tribulation that God's putting you through. You don't want to face the truth about yourself. And he says, verse 22, and by the way, in duo put off is an imperative mood in the Greek. That's a command. So he's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to predestinated elect. And that you put off, verse 22, concerning the former conversation, conversation, anastrophe, A-N-A, S-T-R-O-P-H-E, your mode or method of living, put off the, the outer man, Get rid of him. And then he goes on to say that you put off concerning the, the way you talked and walked. No more cussing. No more drinking. Talk Jesus all the time. The former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to seedful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man. That's the inner man Christ in you. Which after Christ is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore putting away lying. Put away apotithome. Apo. T-I-T-H-E-M-I. Tithome means to lay aside, lay away, put off. Put away lying, speak every man truth to his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And I'll give you one more of these. Do I have any time, Mike? Ephesians 6, 11. Put on the whole armor of God. Put on in duo. Sink into this clothing. This is all the same thing as baptism. But baptism is death to self. It's death to the outer man. You get to a place where the outer man can't be offended. You don't deserve anything anyway. Neither do I. If we don't deserve nothing, why are we fighting for ourselves? You know? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against ourselves. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. That's amazing that that was put in there. 
The rulers of the darkness was the moon, and the moon worship was the Babylonians, and the Babylonians served self, and they built their whole system on let us make us a name. Let me make myself somebody against spiritual wickedness in high places. The high places is where they kept their tree goddesses outside the cities. Wherefore, take unto you, and this is the armor of God, taking you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having all to stand. The evil day is when men come and they want to cut you off. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. That's what's going to protect us. The righteousness is the blood of, is the blood of Christ. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Whew. The gospel, the gospel being the narrow way is a peaceful way. Because when you begin to shove the world aside, then you don't, you're no longer competition for the people out here seeking the world and they kind of leave you alone. So it's a gospel of a rain, a peace, a R A N A, means to come together into one. It's the exact opposite of breaking in pieces and scattering abroad. Above all, taking the shield of faith, that's what's going to quench the fiery darts. Able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. That word quench is the word asbestos. A-S-B-E-S-T-O-S. Asbestos is supposed to cut the, there's supposed to be a fire retardant. I'm out of time. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the truth. Thank you for all that you've given us here. I don't even know how to explain all this. Lord, it's so much. It all goes together. Thank you for your word. I pray you'll strengthen the flock, those that are watching. I pray that you'll give me strength. I'm old, I'm tired, I'm getting a lot of aches and pains. Give me direction that I should go so I can continue to do this for years to come. Help us, Lord. Help the sheep. Open up doors for the ministry in Christ's name. Amen. I can't get all this done. I mean, I see that predestination has everything to do with this inner and this outer man. It's all spiritual circumcision. I'm sorry, I'm yawning. I've got some checks for y'all in the car. Oh, can you um, look that over at your leisure? Just let me know what you think. You don't have to look at it now. Okay. It's just um, a station you might want to go on. Okay. And the open times. Thank you, Rusty. I appreciate you. I love you, brother. Love you too, man. I really do. You take care.